Good morning, everyone. Oh. Well, there's so much you forget you have them all. All right. Good morning. So, uh, she mentioned this uh, first topic for today is going to be non rem parasomnias. Can you? Sure, absolutely. Let me make it a little closer there. So, uh, let me just make sure I can work the clicker here. Okay, well, maybe I'll try it the old fashioned way here. So sorry, I can't seem to get it to advance. Here we go, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, I can do it this way. All right. Found a way. Always the tech person just has to walk up in order for it to be fixed, right? Um, so, uh, as a uh, uh, sleep technologist, I'm sure you'll encounter these over your career, and they're one of those uh, entities that are extremely interesting to see. You don't see them every night, you don't see them every week, certainly, but uh, it's a lot of uh, a lot of fun in terms of being interesting because uh, usually you can do quite a bit to uh, to help these individuals and, and an accurate diagnosis uh, and uh, flagging of any of these kinds of events really can be quite life changing for people. So, uh, as you know, non REM sleep is the vast majority of the night's sleep. You know, it's uh, uh, at least three quarters of the night in general. Uh, and these parasomnia. Okay, thanks. Uh, so these are, uh, by definition, arousals from sleep associated with a confusional state. Uh, they're not oriented to their environment and circumstances. And in general, they are amnestic of the events, whatever has occurred. Uh, but there can be some degree of recall, but usually that's quite minimal, and uh, typically not the case. Uh, we'll look at some of the different types of parasomnias and some uh, treatment options. So in terms of pathophysiology, what causes these? Basically, you have an incomplete transition from stage in REM to uh, wake, okay? So somebody's caught kind of in between, in the middle. Uh, and it's really a, as a result of different neural structures, part of them being in the wake state and part of them being in the sleep state, okay? Uh, somebody did um, several years ago an interesting study looking at the single uh, photon um, emission CT scans of individuals while they're having parasomnia behaviors, and it showed the decreased frontal parietal blood flow. So that's main, the main cortex in terms of alertness, awareness, you know, consciousness, and actually increased blood flow in the cingulate gyrus cortex. So that's uh, one of the uh, main uh, nuclei involved with emotional content. So you'll see how that kind of ties in in a second. And uh, increased activity in the anterior cerebellar uh, cortex. So obviously that's where you get your motoric effects. That's where they start to act out things and perform motor acts, okay? Any kind of sleep fragmentation predisposes to having parasomnia behaviors. Anything that enhances slow wave sleep also prompts these parasomnias and others as far as that is concerned. Anything that you know kind of increases that sleep drive, uh, that homeostatic sleep drive, it makes it more difficult to get beyond that threshold for arousal, okay? Um, likewise, medications that cause sedation can also contribute to these because it's more difficult to transition then from sleep to wake. The physiologic responses uh, are oftentimes tied in with those uh, areas of the brain involved, so emotions. So that's why you can see aggression or 
uh, feeding behaviors, things like that, kind of more primordial type activities. So as far as diagnostic criteria go, uh, it has to be recurrent, okay? It can't just be an isolated episode. Uh, so this has to be a pattern. I mean, just because somebody's only had one episode, it doesn't mean they don't have it. it just means so far you can't label it that, you know, that you have to have a pattern of recurrent episodes. Uh, again, as I mentioned, very little recall, very poor recall of the events, little to no recall really in general. Uh, at most what you get kind of is a vague, yeah, I think maybe I, I remember a little bit about getting up and walking last night. But what they tend to really remember is uh, the termination of the event. So sometimes people will sleepwalk and say, you know, no, I realized I was standing out on the front porch, you know, or something like that. So it's really when they kind of switch to that conscious state is what they recall. Uh, no dream imagery really, uh, because obviously that's much more likely to be REM sleep behavior disorder uh, because these are non-REM sleep. Uh, events. You can actually have some dreaming in non-REM sleep, uh, but it's the, uh, usually it's more um, kind of flashes or images, you know, kind of like your gray and white. The, the way uh, uh, I heard it put one time is any dreaming you have during non-REM sleep is kind of like the old uh, antenna reception on black and white where you got a still image and uh, the, the dreaming you get during stage REM sleep, that's the Technicolor movies, okay? So uh, another thing is they don't really respond to redirection extremely well. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute, with sleepwalkers, you can kind of, you know, put your arm on their shoulder and say, come on, let's go back to bed. To that degree, yes, a lot of times you can, but sometimes even you don't get that much of a response. Uh, but definitely you don't want to restrain them. When you attempt to restrain someone, that's when they can get more aggressive, okay, for sure. And of course, uh, it's not explained by other conditions. So for example, like if someone has PTSD and you know they have an episode like uh, something, you know, and that can be varied, uh, but they, you know, they report, no, I remember you know, upon awakening that, that sort of traumatic event that triggered this. All right, so these are, as I mentioned, disorders of arousal. And we'll talk about sleepwalking, sleep terrors, confusional arousals, uh, sex somnias. Uh, I figured we needed to throw something in there to wake everybody up since it's so early. Uh, <laughs> and uh, some of the shared features are, um, uh, you know, those that we, we talked about and triggers of those can be sleep deprivation, okay? Uh, and again, that's something that affects your homeostatic sleep drive. So when you do go to sleep, you have a much stronger drive to, to stay asleep. And so that makes that threshold arousal uh, more difficult. Uh, stress, uh, other psychiatric disorders, you see it in high association with those. Uh, central nervous system depressants, Okay, because again, you're affecting that, that threshold arousal. Uh, environmental stimuli obviously cause the sleep fragmentation and interruption, which gives rise to the events potentially. And anything that can cause that kind of sleep fragmentation, you know, sleep apnea, restless legs, reflux, you know, all those kind of things, that can lend itself to not just REM, non REM parasomnias, but any parasomnia. So oftentimes you find that if somebody has untreated sleep apnea, uh, you know, the rule of thumb in sleep is always treat the sleep apnea first, right? So a lot of times you do that and then all of a sudden these parasomnias go away because it's that recurrent interruption that's, you know, triggering the events. So then if you allow, you know, better sleep through the night, then uh, that's the first and simplest way to, uh, to make it go away. For a lot of people, there can be a genetic factor uh, there are some HLA, human leukocyte antigen uh, associations, and there's a locus on uh, chromosome 20 that's been uh, associated with sleepwalking uh, predisposition. So it's kind of interesting. And we probably just started to scratch the surface on uh, the genetic information about associations there. Other things that you have to differentiate these from are things like nocturnal seizures. Uh, so... <clears throat> 
and I'll show you a slide here in a few minutes with a PSG example, and I'll kind of illustrate this. But uh, with the nocturnal seizures, and, and probably many of you have seen this, with the seizure activity, you see a gradual buildup in general in terms of that activity, then triggering the, the seizure activity, and also a tapering off. Uh, one hallmark of seizure activity is you don't tend to get just abrupt uh, discharges, but uh, you can, you know, certainly you, you can in some cases, but for the most part, you'll see that that build up in intensity uh, and amplitude and then a, a tapering off. Uh, the wetting the bed urinary incontinence, you see a lot of that with seizures. And you may say, wait a minute, with sleepwalking, you know, you can get that too. But usually that's unusual in that they don't urinate as much in the bed. They oftentimes get up and, you know, walk to a closet and go to the bathroom or something like that. Um, the seizures usually are brief, uh, around a minute or less, uh, 30 to 90 seconds, somewhere in that time frame. Most of them, again, there are always exceptions. Uh, but, uh, and then, of course, you'll see that uh, ictal activity on the uh, EEG. Yes, sir. Usually uh, around 30 seconds or so, if it's a seizure. Now, you can also have ictal discharges, and you definitely see a lot of that, where someone with epilepsy, like if you're doing a full EEG, you'll see a, an epileptiform discharge, and it can be an isolated discharge. Continued, yeah. Right. Right. That can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Well, Yeah, uh, and there are good examples. There are, you know, good atlases out there to illustrate these, but it depends a lot on the type of epilepsy. Um, and maybe that'd be a good talk for another uh, session sometime, but there's some where you can see kind of a generalized spike and wave discharge. Uh, but, you know, like with most seizures and epilepsy, it's a partial epilepsy, meaning it starts off in one area. Now it'll have a field, so you shouldn't see it in just one lead. But, uh, but yeah, so it's, uh, it depends, you can, yeah, it, yes, you can, sure. Uh, and then of course, uh, REM sleep behavior disorder, but usually that occurs in the last half of the night, non-REM parasomnias are more frequently seen in the first half of the night. And of course, the hallmark of REM sleep behavior disorder is that uh, loss of REM atonia, and interestingly, REM sleep behavior disorder rarely, very rarely hawks, okay? They may jump out of bed, uh, they may punch the wall, you know, things like that, but they don't usually get up and walk around. So, uh, so sleepwalking, uh, the prevalence uh, in pediatric populations uh, between ages about two and a half to 13 is estimated at around 29%. Uh, uh, that uh, seems high, you know, but uh, that's based off a population-based study. Uh, the peak incidence is around age 10. Uh, and interestingly, having a parental history drastically increases that by three to seven times uh, as compared to individuals who don't have a parental history. If one parent has it, uh, there's a, a, an almost 50% prevalence. And if two parents, uh, both parents have it, then that can increase to over 60%. Uh, adult prevalence obviously is much, much less, one to 4%. Uh, oftentimes that's more in uh, younger adult ages, like with a lot of other things, this tends to diminish uh, over time. And the lifetime incidence is around 7%. And as you all know, you know there can be varied behaviors uh, primarily just walking. Usually uh, they can go to the refrigerator and drink something or may use the bathroom in an inappropriate place. Um, 
And uh, uh, very rarely can it involve something like driving, you know, things like that. So uh, if it involves that degree of complex motoric behavior, then you really need to take a close, close look at it, see if, if there's not something else taking place. Uh, there are a lot of associations. Uh, again, those other conditions that lead to sleep fragmentation, uh, antidepressant medication use, antipsychotic use. Uh, singular, the allergy medication uh, can be associated with it. Uh, beta blockers, the antibiotics, the quinolones like ciprofloxacin, you know, medications like that, levofloxacin. But in particular, it's your non-benzodiazepine GABA agonist sedative hypnotics, things like your Zolpidem and so forth, uh, acipiclone, and sodium oxabate or, or the Xyrem, Zywave, uh, because they really drastically increase uh, that slow wave sleep. Okay, so you're further uh, causing issues with that homeostatic drive. Also, fever, uh, pain conditions uh, can, can trigger that. 20% um, of people who have it as uh, uh, children can have it as an adult. Uh, so as you can see, in the vast majority of people, it really does go away uh, after childhood. It depends usually uh, in 20s to early 30s, something like that. But I mean, you know, you can have sleepwalkers that are older, 40s, 50s, you know, 60s, but definitely more in young adult ages. Oh, are you saying only if, if it's a childhood sufferer and then they have it as an adult? Is it only brought on by medications? No, not necessarily, but that can make it more likely if they do uh, take any kind of sedative hypnotic. Um, as I mentioned, you're trying to avoid the restraint. Uh, you definitely, um, <clears throat> in terms of treatment, want to try and ensure a safe environment. So, because there have been cases of people sleepwalking off of balconies or, uh, or elevated porches or, going through windows, actually. So you really do have to take it quite seriously uh, uh, because you know, it can be quite serious in terms of the harm that they have. Uh, one tactic is uh, that I really like is an anticipatory awakening. What does that mean? That's where, uh, you know, you primarily get your, some of your most dense uh, stage N3 slow wave sleep during that first part of the night after about an hour or so, something like that. So usually about an hour into sleep, or, you know, if people say, well, you know, so-and-so tends to sleepwalk at midnight. Okay, well then there you got your target. You wanna go just a little before that, maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes before that typical time, or if you don't necessarily have a time uh, identified, you can say about an hour, hour and 15 minutes into sleep. Uh, go in and lightly wake them up, okay? Uh, like if it's a child, what you can do is uh, kind of wet a uh, washcloth and go in and, you know, brush it across their forehead and on their cheeks, you know, just enough to bring them out of that uh, deeper stage of sleep. They don't even necessarily have to wake up, uh, but you're just bringing them to a, you know, in one or in two, something like that, and you kind of reset that. So uh, that alone can be very effective uh, at helping with this. Um, obviously, if there's any kind of underlying condition, you know, obviously treat that. That really helps reduce those parasomnias. Uh, avoid any kind of uh, uh, situation that increases that homeostatic drive, like sleep deprivation and things and shift work and things like that. Uh, and then, of course, if you know it persists, you can always get door alarms. Uh, or sometimes bed alarms, um, so that other people in the house know, you know, oh, they're they're up, you know, <laughs> there they go again, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And then actually, uh, it may sound ridiculous, but actually hypnosis has been shown to help with um, a lot of people with some of the parasomnias. The tough thing with that is you have to have somebody that really knows what they're doing in order to be able to teach them, you know, how to do that. Um, there's 
<laughs> in general, you, you don't want a hypnotist, you want a psychologist who, uh, uh, who, who specializes in knowing how to do that. If you need medication, clonazepam can be used, okay? And then uh, I mentioned some uh, EEG finding, or excuse me, PSG finding, but it's the EEG component. All right, if you look here, you can see the arrow and that points to the hypersynchronous delta that you can sometimes see with uh, the parasomnia, uh, uh, not just sleepwalking, but some of the others as well. And that can be kind of like what you were alluding to earlier, sir, uh, variably associated with the arousal. That can happen before you ever see any activity or you can see it you know, happen concurrently, okay? Um, after the uh, arousal, you can get continued slow wave activity kind of continuing variably, or they can revert back to non-REM sleep. So it's, and that's something that's always been kind of interesting to me is that, you know, sometimes they'll have uh, this uh, return to a normal appearing sleep pattern. And then uh, sometimes, you know, you can, you can get actually into an alpha waking rhythm appearance. So, uh, so, so it's quite variable. All right, so sleep terrors. Uh, how many people in here have ever personally encountered a sleep terror? Okay, a few. So uh, if you have, you don't forget it because it's uh, usually a blood curdling shriek and cry in the middle of the night, uh, more common in uh, childhood, obviously. Very abrupt onset, okay. And the, the, the shrieking and, and scream component is important and that can really help uh, distinguish this from other entities. Uh, you get a lot of uh, autonomic hyperactivity with this, uh, you know, the uh, increased heart rate, um, respiratory rate, they can be sweaty. Uh, madriasis is the dilated pupils. Uh, and then also sometimes increased muscle tone. They're absolutely inconsolable during the event. Uh, they uh, have this intense fear uh, associated with it. Um, they're typically amnestic of the events. Okay, again, so a lot of times you'll ask these children and they say, what, I didn't do anything last night, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so uh, the, the prevalence rates, um, can be quite varied, anywhere from uh, 15 to 56 percent or so. I think the 56 percent is definitely a little high. It seems uh, prevalence in adulthood is is much much lower, at only around two percent. Um, and in fact, if you see it in an adult, you really need to delve into the history because a lot of times there are other things that can mimic that. Uh, so some of which are things like uh, PTSD and, and so forth. So uh, some entities that are definitely decidedly more common. Um, some of the things you have to distinguish uh, as a, a different entity are things like panic attacks and nightmares. Uh, and one thing is you don't typically get the, the shriek, scream, the loud cry with these other things, okay? Um, uh, usually people with sleep terrors bolt upright, sit upright in bed. If it's a nightmare, they don't tend to sit up. They tend to just lie there. They can, of course, but it's not that sort of, you know, up like a, you know, something out of a scary movie where they sit up and uh, emit the loud cry. But uh, uh, with uh, the panic attacks, usually they have some daytime issues with panic or anxiety as well. You know, whereas, of course, with sleep terrors, you don't get any daytime events. Um, you can see the hypersynchronous delta with sleep terrors as well. Uh, and again, some of the uh, typical for parasomnia triggers, sleep deprivation, uh, stressors, uh, any, anything that's a, a stress to the child, uh, and forced awakenings. So some, sometimes something just slightly uh, interrupting their sleep can, can trigger a sleep terror. Uh, and some of the other things that you can do in addition to the anticipatory awakenings, which also works extremely well for this, in my experience, but is increasing their daytime napping or duration, okay? So if the child doesn't take naps, try and introduce naps. Uh, or if they take a 10-minute nap every day, you know, try and make that like a 
30, 40 minute nap, you know, that kind of thing. Because what you're doing is kind of decreasing that, that homeostatic sleep drive. So that can make it more difficult for them to be caught in that, that transition state um, between sleep and wake, okay? Um, <clears throat> confusional arousals, very common thing. I'm sure we've all probably experienced uh, those with certain individuals at times. Uh, this can be bizarre and oftentimes the people who have them get blamed for having them, even though they're not necessarily trying to do it. But this is the person where you know, if you go in and try and wake them up, you know, they take a swing, you know, that sort of thing. Everybody's heard of that. I've heard of uh, several wives who say, you know, I wake my husband up with a broom handle by <laughs> nudging him because he usually takes a swing at me. So, uh, and again, that's also that incomplete awakening from slow wave sleep. The individual's not uh, oriented. They're, they're not really coordinated, obviously, with what they're doing. That's why it's kind of more gross motor acts. Uh, if they do speak, they can speak. Sometimes it's just kind of a, a drowsy, like they're drugged, almost nonsensical uh, utterance. Um, and, uh, and they can do the, the inappropriate behaviors like we talked about. Uh, this can be uh, typically induced by the forced awakenings Okay, um, so, you know, if you can find a workaround for that where, you know, you're, you're sure that they try and get sufficient sleep so that you're not uh, awakening them from uh, uh, a solid sleep and that they've gotten their full night and that sort of thing, that can help. Uh, usually, um, it's a brief, but they can be more prolonged. I've never seen a case of that, but can be on the order of several minutes, potentially. In my experience, it's usually quite brief, more on the order of seconds. So, um, and, and you do see more of this with the uh, uh, sleep aid uh, medications. So uh, any of those can definitely increase that. You know, trazodone, it's, it's possible, but you don't see it as much as with the others, the ones that are the GABA agonists, like your, your, your Z drugs, you know, the uh, Zaloplan, Zolpidem, Zopaclone, uh, you know, even though that one starts with an ES before the Z, but anyway, the, the Z medications are more notorious for it. Um, uh, and with the confusional arousals, if they're sleepwalking or something like that, that's not a confusional arousals because that does not involve walking, okay? Uh, they stay in the bed and they may mumble a little bit or, you know, that sort of thing. But, uh, and if they try and do anything physically, it's just sort of this kind of clumsy action. Uh, and oftentimes they have no recall uh, of, of doing that. Right. Uh, you can get sympathetic hyperactivity, so you can't, this is usually not as pronounced as with other things like the sleep tears and things like that, but you can get the increased heart rate, respiratory rate. Uh, it does tend to improve with age, um, but uh, not necessarily. Uh, in children, it's in up to 17%. Uh, seems to me it's more in teenagers, but you know, you can see it in younger kids. And then the adult uh, prevalence is much lower, more like three or 4%. Um, again, the same kind of uh, triggers. And you can also see the, the hypersynchronous delta uh, with the confusional arousals. Okay, sexomnias. Uh, I, maybe I should have put this one as the first slide so that it'd wake everybody up because you almost never see these, you know, it's, it's most people obviously can go their career and never necessarily see somebody with this, but it's, uh, it's a variant of sleepwalking uh, and it actually is real. I know it sounds like the kind of thing where it may be sort of a fabrication, but uh, you, uh, uh, you see it more commonly in men uh, I always get a few chuckles whenever I mention that. That seems obvious, I guess, to everybody. Uh, early adulthood onset um, is typical. Uh, so, you know, 20s um, or so, something like that. Oftentimes they have a history of other uh, disorders of arousal, more, more, most commonly sleepwalking, which makes sense, obviously. This is sleepwalking variant, right? So, um, and you can see any kind of 
behavior. I'll let you read those there. But uh, uh, anyway, it can be anything. Uh, it can be typically aggressive. Uh, and again, it's, part of that's because you're probably activating different parts of the brain that are the more primordial um, nuclei. So that's why uh, it can be not as uh, nuanced a behavior as one might think, perhaps. Exactly, exactly. Uh, typically, they are actually amnestic of the events, believe it or not, uh, which doesn't sound believable. I realize that. But again, you know, it's because of that, uh, that um, impairment of cortical arousal, the, the cortex involved with our consciousness. It can be associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, some of the medications that you use for Parkinson's disease are dopamine agonists. And uh, dopamine uh, is the primary neurotransmitter really involved in kind of the pleasure centers of the brain and things like that. So that's why, and, and plus not to mention that can also lead to a disinhibition uh, with dopaminergic stimulation in the brain. Um, antidepressant medications, uh, shift work uh, has been associated uh, with an increased incidence of the sex omnias. Uh, seizures and epilepsy, even though that's a, that's a little different, that's a little less common, but you can uh, potentially see that. And also there's an association with uh, narcolepsy, okay? Um, <clears throat> again, if there's something underlying like sleep apnea, definitely you wanna treat that to try and decrease the incidence. Uh, if, or if it continues, uh, clonazepam can be a good option. All right, uh, sleep-related eating disorder. Uh, very interesting uh, entity, and I can promise you if you haven't seen anybody with this, you have, but it just wasn't brought to your attention because uh, you definitely see this, especially uh, in people with the uh, uh, non-benzodiazepine uh, sedative hypnotics like uh, Zolpidem and so forth. Um, Zolpidem, seemingly especially, but may, maybe part of that's because that's just so much more commonly prescribed than most of the others. Uh, you can see it also with the atypical antipsychotics and uh, lithium, a medication which is still used for bipolar disorder. Uh, another interesting association with uh, sleep-related eating disorder is actually with uh, restless leg syndrome. Uh, so it's seen in up to a third of restless leg patients. Okay, um, and this is uh, also, uh, it, it's not per se a sleepwalking variant, but it, it's essentially a mimic, just because typically they get up, go to the uh, kitchen, uh, they sloppily prepare food, and usually, because that, that's one of the tip-offs, you know, again, they're amnestic of it, so they go in and look on the uh, countertop and there are crumbs everywhere or sometimes they'll leave you know condiment containers out of the refrigerator and on the counter or or sometimes they actually prepare food directly on the counter so you can see things smeared around on it uh, those kind of things and it's oftentimes kind of interestingly unusual combinations so 